Welcome. Uh, glad that you are joining us for our video podcast. Now, if you're someone who wants the full service, who wants welcome and announcements, wants prayers, wants music, you want to go back to the YouTube page and click on the link that says full service. For those of you that are like, listen, I just kind of want the message. This is the place for you. A chance for us to learn more about how do we live our life with Jesus in the midst of all of life. And so we're glad that you are joining us. If you want to find out more information, go to our website and check it out and click on whatever links most interest you. We're so glad that you're joining us. We look forward to continuing to connect with you and engage with you. If you have questions, if if you have suggestions, if you have things you'd like to ask us about, the best person to connect with is Leah. She is the one who would love to connect with you online in a way to help you grow in your faith wherever you are at. Well, thanks for joining us. Let's jump into this week's teaching. So I'm sure we've all had the experience when we walk into a business or a school or even a church and you see up on the wall, uh, likely in big, bold print, what their mission statement is. And as you read the mission statement, you probably think, yeah, that's kind of what I expected. The question that comes to mind is, well, how does this play out? Like, Like, what exactly does it look like? I mean, end of the day, the the mission statement or the purpose is the why behind everything they do. And it's important to know, it's important to have, but how does it start to play out day to day? If you're just joining us for the first time or you've been hanging around us for a little time, maybe you don't know what our mission statement is, what, what our purpose is. Let me say it for you real succinctly. The why behind everything we do, the purpose of our church is this to lead people to Jesus. Real simple. Some of you are probably like, well, that kind of makes sense. That's what it should be, right? The question is, well, what does it look like? You see, for us as a church, everything we do, every decision we make, every ministry that we roll out is always with the purpose of wanting to lead people to Jesus. Why? Because we believe that it is in Jesus that, that lives are changed, they're, they're transformed, that, that communities are impacted for good. And sometimes I think we can lose sight of this. This past week, I got this text from a woman. Her name is Katrina. She and her family have been uh, a part of our church for a, a number of years. And in her text, it reminded me again that as a church, we want to be leading people to Jesus. Why? Well, let me read what she sent to me. Hey, Joel, I just wanted to share with you that the Holy Spirit came into me last week. I've been going through a lot of searching the month prior, and I feel the need to share with those who can really appreciate how this takes over a person. It almost feels supernatural to an extent. Thank you for being a part of this journey, and now life really begins. That text literally stopped me in my tracks and reminded me again of why we do what we do, to lead people to Jesus. Because as in the case of Katrina, as in the case of many others, lives are changed, lives are transformed. And I love the line of how she says, now life truly begins. When I think of us as a church, when I think of our purpose of leading people to Jesus, it is precisely for this reason. So what does it look like? How do we begin to do it in the day to day? That is what today is going to be all about. Talking about one particular thing that I believe we as individuals, that we as a church need to make a priority if we want to see people come to know and love and to follow Jesus. I love that line by Katrina of how she mentions that life is a journey. And I believe all of us, regardless of where you are, where it comes to faith, are on a journey. For some of you watching, you may be journeying towards Jesus, that that you're not quite there yet. Well, today is a message that I believe might expose one of the greatest obstacles as to why you haven't fully experienced Jesus yet. So so you want to continue to listen in. For those of us who are on a journey already with Jesus, that, that we've made that commitment, we've made, we've seen that transformation, this message is a reminder for all of us what must be a priority for us. 
that if we want to see other people come to know and to love Jesus, this has to be present in the midst of life. Because this is a game changer. And I can almost see the building sense of anticipation. What is it going to be? Let me boil it down to one word. The most, one of the most important things we need to do if we want to see people come to know Jesus is this. Posture. How we treat others. You may think, whoa, 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 wait, wait, wait a second, wait a second. What about teaching? What about telling others about Jesus? What about serving? What about giving? What about worship? What about Sunday morning experience? What about all these other things? Listen, listen. I know they're important. I know they are necessary. But I believe we won't get there if we have a crappy posture. In the bottom of the screen, you, you see the the slogan for Paris. And maybe you're sitting there thinking, like, what is this all about? Why do you always talk about being for Paris? What does that mean? Listen, that's not just a slogan. That's a reminder of the importance of posture in the midst of our lives. Let me frame it a different way. For Paris means that we are for people. It doesn't talk about all of our theological positions, which we have. It doesn't talk about all of our ministries, which we are engaged in. It's a constant and daily reminder of the importance of posture. And so, so why is posture so important? Listen, we know physically that if you have crappy posture, like if you slouch or if you don't stand properly, it's going to impact the rest of your body. The rest of your body is not going to function well because you have lousy posture. Well, in that light, think of it in a spiritual context. That if as followers of Jesus, if as a church, we have crappy posture, then it's going to impact our ministries. It's going to impact our witness. And I would even suggest that it can create a barrier to leading people to Jesus. Just think of the last couple of years with COVID, with all of the positions that Christians and some churches have taken, they have had terrible posture to the point where I'd even say that there are people who've carried the same position that I would, and I almost want to distance myself from them because they have such lousy posture. Now, to those of you that are journeying towards Jesus, maybe you're like, you know what, I've never said this before, but amen to that, right? Because you have landed in a place where you have been interested about Jesus, but you've met Christians, you've come to churches, and their postures have been judgmental have been opinionated, have, have put you so off that you're thinking, listen, if those are the people that know Jesus, then I'm not sure I want to know him either. It's posture that has pushed you away, which is why this is so important. And listen, this is not just me going off. This is not just uh, Joel having a, a rant moment. I have it on good authority. It comes from Jesus that posture matters. We're starting a new series that's going to lead us right through Easter about, that's called Encounters. Experiencing God in unexpected places. That, and what we're going to see is these incredible moments where Jesus has this posture of meeting people where they are at. And as a result, it brings transformation into lives. What we're going to see is how oftentimes Jesus was ridiculed by the religious institution, by the religious authorities because of his posture towards what they would view as the sinners, you know, like the tax collectors and, and the prostitutes and, and the people that are left on the margins. Jesus met them there. This is going to be a series that's going to remind us again of not only how Jesus meets us wherever we are at, but the importance of posture. And so to kick it off, I want to land at a passage in the book of John, John chapter 13, where Jesus emphasizes this at a critical, critical moment of his ministry, of the importance of posture. It's John chapter 13, and let me just set the scenario for you. It's, it's Jesus and his disciples in a rented room in Jerusalem celebrating Passover. Now, now, Passover was the Jewish celebration of when God freed them from slavery in Egypt. Real, real big deal. And so Jesus and his followers met up in a rented room to celebrate Passover. Well, they get in this rented room, and one of the customs for the Jews is that when you come into a room for this one of these celebrations, you want to wash your feet. I don't know about you, but feet are nasty. They are one of the nastiest parts of anyone's body, especially when you're wearing sandals and in dirt and grime and all the other stuff. And normally, it'd be the role of a servant to come and wash your feet. It's a posture that nobody wants. Well, they're in a rented room. There's no servant anywhere to be found. 
And so the disciples, I'm purely speculating, probably looking around like, who's going to wash my feet? At which point their jaws would have dropped, their eyes would have opened because Jesus was down on his knees washing their feet. Jesus sets up the whole evening with a posture of love and of service. This was the night when he was about to be betrayed. He'd be falsely accused. The following day, he'd be beaten. He'd be spit upon. He'd be tortured. And he would be crucified. This was the night that Jesus was washing the feet of those, of one who would betray him, another who would deny him, and the rest of them would completely abandon him. Yet Jesus takes a posture of service and love. And then Jesus, at the end of the evening, says this. Three verses for us to lock in on. He says, dear children, I will only be with you a little longer. And as I told the Jewish leaders, you will search for me, but you can't come where I am going. Pause there for a moment. Jesus is basically saying, I'm going to die. I'm going to leave you. You're not going to come where I am going. But then in verse 34, he says this. He says, so now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love one another just as I have loved you. You should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Right there. Maybe you've heard this before, right? Jesus says, love one another just as I have loved you. Notice Jesus isn't saying, I want you to feel something. I want you to believe something. No, he's like, I want you to do something. I want you to love one another. Now at the start of it, he says, a new command I give to you. And if you're one of the dudes sitting in the room that night, you might be thinking, um, wait a second, Jesus, this isn't actually a new command. Back in the Old Testament, in the book of Leviticus, if you're going to be the real kind of smart Alex student, is like, um, we have been told before how we are to love our neighbor as ourself. Now, I'm not splitting hairs here. There's a distinct difference. The Old Testament says, love your neighbor as yourself. So the bar is yourself. Not a bad bar. You want to love people as you want to be loved. But Jesus is like, you know what? I'm raising the bar. That's not good enough. I want you to love others as I have loved you. Jesus is saying the bar for your love, the bar for your posture is no longer yourself. It is me. Now, again, pure speculation. But I wonder if as Jesus uttered these words, those disciples must have started to reflect upon the ways in which Jesus had loved them. Just probably an hour earlier, Jesus had washed their feet when they weren't willing to wash anyone else's feet. Maybe we went back to the very first time that Jesus encountered them and met them where they were at, in the loneliness, in the difficulties, in in the midst of where others had rejected them. Maybe their mind was going back to the places of, of how Jesus met the outcasts of the world and sat and ate with them. They're reminded again of this type of love. And then Jesus says, when you love others as I have loved you, this, this will be the evidence that you are my disciples. Not how well you know the scripture, not how eloquent your prayers are, not even what you give to the poor. By your love, people will know that you are mine. Jesus is emphasizing the importance of posture. So let's get personal. Where do we land? Where do you land? What is your posture towards those you disagree with? Let's be honest. Let's be honest. It's easy to have a posture towards those we love, those we like, those we're related to, mostly. But what about What about people to whom we disagree, people who have offended us, people who have hurt us, people who hold different positions than us, people who who vote for different political parties than us, people who have approached COVID in different ways than us? What is our posture towards them? Let me ask you another question. What would Jesus think if he looked at your social media feed right now? Would it convey a posture of love? Would it convey a posture that would be evidence that you are truly one of his followers? You see, here's the interesting thing for us to understand. 
And this is where it gets countercultural with Jesus. Jesus' love does not require agreement. Let me say that again. Jesus' love does not require agreement. You see, so often we think, I will love you if I agree with you, if we can land at the same place. But Jesus is saying something greater. So, so, if we truly want to lead people to Jesus, yes, we have it up on the wall. What does it look like? It begins with posture. It means that, that, that as a church, we are going to be for Paris because we are for people. It means that we want to be welcoming of those to whom we may disagree, with whom we may hold different positions. It means that we want to have ministries that, that reach out to people where they are at, not where we expect them to be. It means that as a posture we're of, of being four pairs and four people, we're going to use our stuff for others. It's why we run our summer sports kids program. It's why we do the raw carrot. It's why we do community dinner. It's why we allow the community to use our building. In ways, and let's be honest, at times we're like, I'm not sure I completely agree with that. But this is the posture that we are taking. Because here's the truth. Think about this. Our biggest impact on this community is not going to be our ministries, not going to be our building, not even going to be our Sunday experience, whether online or in person, as incredible as it may be. It's going to be about you and me. And the posture we take. If we have a crappy posture, if we are unloving, nothing else really matters. Because those of you that are journeying towards Jesus, you, you've probably seen this. You've probably seen how too often people who hold these positions of Jesus are just completely unloving to others and you're like, I want nothing to do with that. And the journey seemingly pauses there. So what can we do? What's, what's our takeaway? For those of you that are journeying towards Jesus, your only takeaway is this. Hang with us the next number of weeks. Come back. Because we are going to experience some incredible encounters of Jesus with others where he meets them where they are at, but they leave completely changed. And I believe the same can be true for you. Okay? Just hang out with us the next few weeks. For those of us, for those of us, I'm looking at you. For those of us that are followers of Jesus, that are journeying with Jesus, I got four things for you. Four things for you. The first one is we start to think about posture. Number one, stop trying harder, right? It's the place we always go. You hear this message and you're like, yes, yes, I'm going to love more. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a better posture. You know, I may have been a jerk in the past, but no more. And it might last for a day or a week or a season, depending upon how self-disciplined you are, but it's not going to last for long. Why? Because people are annoying, right? Let's, let's just be honest about that, right? And there's going to get to a point where you're like, if I just simply try harder, it's going to be all about me and I can't do it. That's why Jesus said, a new command I give you. Love one another. He didn't end the statement there. As I, as I have loved you. The way that we love others and have a posture towards others that is loving is by putting our focus always back to Jesus. In the same way that I think the disciples must have paused for a moment and started to reflect upon all the ways that Jesus has loved them, can you do the same thing? Can you reflect upon the ways that Jesus has loved you? And at that moment when Jesus taught this, he hadn't even displayed his greatest act of love, which was dying on the cross. And so every time you, you meet those people that you're like, God, I can't love them. Think of how Jesus has loved you and see what that starts to do within you. That's number one. Second thing, real practical here, game changer, be kind. Be kind. If, if you're struggling with what do I do, what does a loving posture look like? Be kind. Listen, we have a bit of a reset here. With, with some of the restrictions being lessened, this week you're going to walk into supermarkets, you're going to walk into restaurants, you're going to walk into hockey arenas, you're going to walk into churches, and not everyone's going to be wearing a mask. And you may rejoice in that, or that may absolutely terrify you. Regardless of what your position is, be kind. 
particularly with those you don't agree with. Be kind. The third one, this goes back to something earlier I said, don't miss this series, Encounters. We are going to see again and again the posture of Jesus to those who the religious institution probably thought they don't deserve it. But that's the grace of God. And so you too join us. If you know someone who maybe is a little bit disenfranchised with the church or has kind of been turned off by, by, by other Christians and has kind of walked away from Jesus, this is a series to invite them to. So whether it's online or whether it's in person, get people with you to watch this series. Number four, last one right here. Remember, remember, for Paris means for people. I, I think it was Drucker who said this. Culture eats strategy for breakfast. It means that you can have the best strategies. You can have the best ministries. You can have the best online experience. You can have the best in-person experience. But if we have a crappy culture that is established by lousy posture, it's not going to last. It's not going to make a difference. Listen, if as a church, we want to lead people to Jesus, it means we have to be for Paris. We have to be for people. It means we have to have a posture that was established by Jesus that is shown through love. And we're going to help to remind you of this. Maybe you want to buy some swag as a reminder for you. Next week, we have a special surprise. We're going to have a visual illustration that you are not going to want to miss. We're going to show it to you online, but I'm going to tell you straight up, it's going to be way better, way more worth it to be in person. And so if you haven't been in person, then, then you definitely want to show up next week, Sunday, 10.30 a.m., because this is going to be a visual reminder that's not going to go away anytime soon, a reminder over and over and over again that we are for people. We are for pairs. Posture matters. Why? Why? Because we want to see lives change. And that happens when people encounter Jesus, as Katrina did. As she said, life has truly begun. If you're someone journeying towards Jesus, don't you want that? Don't you want this, this, this reality that the life is completely changed, transformed for the better? If you're someone who is journeying with Jesus, don't you want that for someone else? Posture. Jesus says, a new command I give you, love others as I have loved you. By this, people will know you are my disciples. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, as we hear these words, simple yet profound, may we not just gloss over them. May we not allow them just to become sentimental. May we not feel guilted by them but may we be moved by them. May we see this as an opportunity to to truly live out our faith, to love as you have loved us. I pray for those that are journeying towards you, Jesus, that, that, that they would get to know you more and more each day, that they would experience your posture of love and grace. For those of us that are journeying with you, Jesus, may we display the grace, the mercy, and the love that you so abundantly have shown us. For we ask it all, Jesus, in your name. Amen. So now may the Lord bless you and keep you. Now may the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious towards you. Now may Jesus meet you in the most unexpected places and show you his great love. For we ask this, all of this, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, and our Savior. Amen.